someone that absolutely loves ASMR Unsolved Mysteries videos. It can also be a bit, you know, interesting whilst trying to relax to these videos. And I just love Unsolved Mysteries and grime in general, so um, I've never made, you know, an Unsolved Mysteries style video before. I thought, why not give it a try? Um, and let me know what you all think about it in the comments down below. If you do enjoy, I'd really appreciate it if you considered giving the video a big thumbs up. And if you do want to see more of these and want to help support the channel, then why not consider subscribing if you're new. And uh, without further ado, there will be timestamps across the bottom to each story I do tonight. But, for those curious, I'm going to be reading these unsolved mysteries from a website called Parade. Parade, Parade, Parade. And the title of this, um, you know, article website thing is Beware These 50 Strangest Solved mysteries of all time are seriously spooky. Now, a quick disclaimer before we get started. Um, I have no idea what's going to be involved in these, so if there are any graphic details or anything that could be a bit sensitive, I do apologize. This is just your little heads up now. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get in the first story I'm going to be reading, and I think I will go with this one here, because I hear this one's quite, I've heard, I've heard of this one before, and this is The Strange Disappearance of D.B. Cooper. Cooper, Cooper, Cooper. On Wednesday, November 24th. 71. A man identified as Daniel Cooper bought a $20 one-way ticket on Northwest Airlines on flight 305 from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Cooper was described as being in his mid-40s, wearing a business suit, an overcoat, brown shoes, a white shirt, and a black tie. He also carried a briefcase and a brown paper bag. Before the flight took off, he ordered a bourbon and soda from a flight attendant. After the plane was airborne, Cooper handed the flight attendant First, she just put it in her pocket without looking at it, but then Cooper told her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Cooper then told her the bomb was in his briefcase and asked her to sit next to him. He opened the briefcase to reveal red colored sticks surrounded by an array of wires. Cooper told the flight attendant to write down everything he was saying and then take it to the captain. The note said, I want $200,000 in cash by 5 p.m. exclusively in $20 bills. Put it in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny 
stuff or I'll do the job. FBI agents assembled the ransom money from several Seattle area banks and Seattle police obtained the parachutes from a local skydiving school. When Cooper claimed his demands were met, he allowed all passengers and some of the crew to exit the plane. Cooper told the remaining crew to refuel the plane and chart a course for Mexico City while staying below 10,000 feet. During the flight, Cooper put on a pair of dark wraparound sunglasses which would make it the official sketch and become famous to anyone investigating the case. A little after 8 p.m. and somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, Cooper jumped out of the rear door of the plane with two of the parachutes and the money. He was never seen again. Despite an expansive manhunt, and over 45 years of searching, no conclusions have been made as to the man's identity or his fate after he jumped. It is called one of the greatest cold cases in FBI and U.S. history. Interesting first story. I've definitely heard of the D.B. Cooper story before, but didn't know, you know, extensively what the notes or demands were and things, and it's really interesting to think maybe D.B. Cooper is still out there, maybe, maybe not. Let me know what you think in the comments. This next unsolved mystery is a very famous one too, and it is the Zodiac. Zodiac Killer. In the late 1960s and early 70s, a serial killer known as the Zodiac Killer terrorized Northern California. There were at least five victims, but later on, the murderer would claim he killed at least 37 people. December 20th, 1968, on Lake Herman Road in Vallejo, 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen were shot and killed while sitting in a parked car in a gravel parking area. By the time the police arrived, Betty was found dead. David was still alive. Unfortunately, he would die on the way to the hospital. This was the first murder that the Zodiac Killer conducted and got away with. The Zodiac's next crime would happen on July 4th, 1969, in Blue Rock Springs Park, only a few minutes away from the The Zodiac Killer approached a parked car with a flashlight and then murdered 22-year-old Darlene Ferret and 19-year-old Michael Mago. Both were still alive when found, but Mago would only survive. He was able to describe the shooter as a young, white male between the ages of 26 and 30. Stocky, 200 pounds or larger, and about 5 foot 8 with light brown curly hair and a large face. Within an hour, the police received a phone call from someone who claimed to be the shooter. And the shooter uh, in the Lake Herman Road murders. On August 1st, 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle and San Francisco Examiner and the Vallejo Herald all 
received a handwritten letter from someone who claimed to be the shooter. The letters revealed specific details about the killings to prove that the writer was indeed the murderer. All the letters were signed with a circle with a cross through it, the symbol that would eventually be known as the mark of the Zodiac Killer. Also included within the letters were three different codes that the Zodiac Killer demanded to be printed in the newspaper or else he would kill again. The Zodiac Killer said that if these codes were cracked, it would reveal his identity. On August 4th, 1969, another letter was received that started with the phrase saying, This is the Zodiac speaking, marking the first time the killer referred to himself as the Zodiac. On August 8th, the code was cracked by a couple in Salinas, California. The code read, I like killing because it is so much fun. It is f more fun than killing wild game uh, in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all to kill. Something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and those I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will slow down or stop collecting my slaves for the afterlife. After claiming three more lives and causing nationwide terror, the Zodiac Killer wrote his final letter on January 29th, 1974, concluding the letter with a new score. Me, 37. SFBD 0 and the true identity of the killer has never been found gosh if that isn't just the most gruesome horrifying story I've ever read in a video I am so so sorry um wow I mean I've heard of the Zodiac killer but I didn't know it was that horrific um like mid story because I was confused about what the first letter might have said when, when he wrote in um, where was it again yeah but that's really cryptic if you pardon the pun and um, it's just horrific that all these lives were lost you know rest in peace to them and that there's people out there that can actually be like this just absolutely disgusting and um, a really weird unsolved mystery that I wish could have been solved to brought it brought to justice. Those words from the cryptic is the fact that someone can say something like that is just horrific, absolutely horrific. This next story is called the Ghost Ship of the Mary Celeste. I should really call it a story because it's true. I don't know. On December 4th, 1872, a British-American ship called the Mary Celeste was found abandoned and floating in the Atlantic Ocean. It was found to be perfectly seaworthy and with its cargo fully which it appeared had been boarded in an orderly fashion. But why? We may never know because no one was on board, because no one on board was ever heard from again. The Mary Celeste set sail from New York bound for Genoa in Italy, 19, uh, 1872 in November. The ship was manned by Captain Benjamin Briggs and seven crew members, including Briggs's wife and two-year-old daughter. Supply 
boys on board were said to last for six months, and there were luxurious items on board, including a sewing machine and an upright piano. Historians and commentators generally, ag generally agree that to abandon such a worthy ship, some extraordinary and alarming circumstances must have arisen. However, the last entry on the ship's daily log reveals nothing unusual, and inside the ship all appeared to be in perfect order. Perfect order. Perfect order. Conspiracy theories over the years have included mutiny, pirate attack, but why would the ship still be there? Um, and even a giant octopus or sea monster attack. However, the cause behind this ghost ship remains unsolved. Um, up next is um, something that has always um, been a bit curious to me and is one that uh, I'm interested to read for you all. And this is <laughs> The Mysterious Death of Tupac Shakur who, for those who don't know, uh, was a rapper. In fact, it actually starts by explaining. On September 7th, 1996, at the MGM Grand Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, well-known rapper Tupac Shakur, or Tupac, was seen attending a Mike Tyson boxing match. After the match, Tupac left with the CEO of Death Row Records, Serge Knight. Upon the departure of the match, Tupac and his bodyguards got into a fight with the Compton-based Southside Grips gang member Orlando Anderson in the lobby of the MGM. After the fight was broken up, Tupac and Knight left in Knight's car with Tupac's entourage following in cars behind them. While stopped at the intersection of Flamingo and Coval, a white Cadillac pulled up to the passenger side of Knight's car, uh, Knight's car and shot out the window, hitting Tupac four times and grazing Knight in the head with a bullet fragment. In 2014, retired LVPD Sergeant Chris Carroll revealed that he was the first police officer at the scene. According to Carroll, when he opened the car door, Tupac fell out the car, covered in blood, and Carroll asked, Who shot you? Tupac took a deep breath and only proclaimed explicative words at the police officer before slipping into unconsciousness. Tupac was then taken to UMC and placed on life support and into a medically induced coma. On September 13th, 1996, six days after the shooting, Tupac died as a result of his injuries at the age of 25. Las Vegas police never arrested anyone in connection with the murder. They also failed to follow up with Yaki Gaddafi, a member of Tupac's entourage who claimed he could identify the asylum. Unfortunately, Gaddafi was murdered only two months after the infamous shooting before he could be interviewed. To this day, no one has been claimed a suspect and no arrests have been made. So I wonder what happened and does 
does it have anything to do with the fight um, that he got into with Surgeon? Uh, not Surge. Um, uh, with uh, Orlando Anderson. Sorry. We'll never know. We'll never know. So I think we'll read maybe two more stories. Um, the next one is called The Watcher House, which I've never heard of before, so it should be um, interesting to read about. In June 2014, Maria and Derek Brodus and their three young children were getting ready to move into their new home, 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey. They claimed that the six-bedroom home was their dream home and located just a couple of blocks away from Maria's childhood home in one of the top 30th safest cities in the United States. From that open paragraph, I can tell it's not going to be one of the safest cities. Three days after the closing, uh, 30 day, thir three days after closing the sale, before the Brodus family had even begun to move in, a letter arrived in their new mailbox. The letter was addressed to the new follows. Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now. And as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched it in the 1960s. It's now my time. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive past the house each day. Maybe I'm in one of them. Look at the windows you see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of many out of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by every day. Maybe I am one. The letter also mentions specifics about the Brodus family. You have children. I have seen them. The letter continued. So far I think there are three that I have counted. Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for your growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call them and draw them to me. At the bottom of the letter, the author used a cursive font to sign the watcher. After receiving the letter, the Brodus family reached out to the previous family who sold them the house, John and Andrea Woods. They stated that during the 23 years of living at 657 Boulevard, they had never received a letter like that, except once, a few days, before they were getting ready to move out the house. The Woods family also stated that they never felt watched in the two decades that they had lived in the house, and in fact, rarely felt the need to lock the door at night. While they thought the note they received was odd, they 
still threw the note away without much concern. Still, the two families went to the police with the letter, and an investigation was opened. The police warned the families not to tell anyone about the letters, including their neighbours, who were now all suspects. Two weeks later, even though the Brodus family still hadn't moved in, they received a second letter with even more chilling specifics about the family, including the children's birth order and nicknames. The watcher also asked, Will the children sleep in the attic, or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I will know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. Several weeks later, the Brodus family had put their plans on hold. To move in, a third letter arrived saying, Where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. By the end of 2014, the case had stalled. There was no digital trail and the mental effects were taking a toll on the Brodus family. There were no fingerprints and no way to place somebody at the scene of the crime. Only six months after they had received the letters, they decided to sell the home. 657 Boulevard has been sold and is currently off the market while the watcher's identity still remains a mystery. <sighs> Gosh, that is um, definitely the eeriest one that we have read in this video. I could not imagine how it would have felt being part of that family receiving those letters and you know, wanting to move into this house. That's really creepy. I wonder if people visit the house often or if it's maybe like guarded off or something. But that is um, pretty terrifying. Imagine you were in that position. I mean, I don't even want to. Alrighty, and last but not least, we have the Gardner Museum. Iced. On March 18th, 1990, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston fell victim to one of the greatest art thefts in history. Only 13 pieces of art were stolen, only, but the combined value of all of those paintings was over. Five hundred million dollars. On the night of the heist, two inexperienced guards were on duty. One of them was named Richard E. Abbott, who was a music school dropout and part of a rock band. By his own admission, he confessed that he would come to work drunk or stoned after a performance. Still, he insisted he was sober on the night of the robbery. At 12.54 a.m., a fire alarm went off on the third floor of the museum. When Abbott went to go investigate, there was no fire. Whether this was part of the thief's scheme is unknown. At 1.24 a.m., which is half an hour later, two men dressed as Boston police buzzed the security desk where Abbott was stationed. The men said that they were responding to a disturbance call and demanded entry. St. Patrick's Day parties were happening around the city, so the disturbance call made sense to Abbott. The guard buzzed the man into the employee entrance, which violated muse museum protocol. Then, <clears throat> when the man reached Abbott behind the desk, one of them said, You look familiar. I think we have a default warrant out for you. Come out here and show us 
with some identification. Abbeth was tricked to leave his control desk, which had the only button that would trigger a silent alarm. He was then instructed to face the wall and was handcuffed. The second guard then appeared and he was also arrested. When the second guard asked why he was being arrested, one of the men replied, You're not being arrested. This is a robbery. Don't give us any problems and you won't get hurt. An hour and 21 minutes later, the thieves made out with the 13 timeless works of art. Remembrance Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and a lady and gentleman in black from their frames. Okay, I thought they were like people for a second. Um, removed for mirrors, the concert and flinks landscape with an obelisk from their frames. Chinese bronze goo or beaker from a table and took a small self-portrait etching by Remembrant from the side of a chest. So that's how they did it all. In the museum today, empty frames now stand where the paintings were hung as Remembrance. The thieves have yet to be caught and the location of the art pieces is still unknown. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum has set a $10 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen works. And that is gonna do it for this video. A very interesting um, one to end on. You know, I didn't want to do too many about um, disappearances or uh, ghosts or murders and whatnot. I wanted to keep it nice and balanced, so hopefully you guys enjoyed the stories I selected from the huge list from that article, which by the way I'll pop in the description if you want to go and have a little bit of a read on your own. Um, I definitely know I will because they're so interesting. And uh, I want to thank all of you so very much for watching tonight's video, and I really hope that you did enjoy it and were able to relax to it as well, so if you did, why not consider giving it a big thumbs up. Let me know if you want to see more videos like this in the future, and um, comment which story was your favorite down below. Other than that, thank you all so much for watching. Sleep well, everybody.